Okay. Hi, everybody. I think we're going to. Uh, I have to unmute myself. Um, can can people hear me, Jenna? Can you hear me okay? I can hear you. Yeah, we can. Thanks. Okay. All right. Sorry. Some weird stuff was going on there with the muting. Um, all right. Well, uh, we'll get going now. And I'd like to thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, owls are usually a, a big draw, but it's really nice to see so many people out here this evening. Um, and some of you may have been attending our weekly um, Birds of Newfoundland webinar, so some of you may know me already, but for those of you who don't, uh, my name is Catherine Dale, and I am the coordinator of the Newfoundland Breeding Bird Atlas, uh, and also the coordinator of the Nocturnal Owl Survey, which is really more of our focus tonight. Uh, and with me tonight monitoring the chat is Jenna McDermott, who is our assistant coordinator for the Atlas and also for the Nocturnal Owl Survey. Uh, so she'll be keeping track of any questions that come up in the chat. Um, I'm just going to ask that because there are so many of us, if we could all, uh, if everyone could keep their mics muted, that would be great. Um, there will be time at the end for questions. So if you want to jump in with questions at the end, you can feel free to unmute yourselves then. All right. Okay. So uh, for those of you who have been attending all of our webinars over the past little while, this will be familiar to you. But uh, both Jenna and I work for an organization called Birds Canada, and Birds Canada is Canada's voice for birds. Uh, it's the leading science-based bird conservation organization in the country. And what we do is we try to advance the understanding, the appreciation, and the conservation of Canada's wild birds and their habitats. Uh, and we do this uh, to, but through conducting strong science, uh, establishing innovative partnerships with other organizations, uh, with government and with industry, and we have offices in virtually every Canadian province, and we run a number of programs, almost all of which are based on the participation of citizen science scientists. So this is people like you uh, who volunteer their time and their energy to go out and collect data on birds all across the country. Um, and with your help, we collect all kinds of data every year. So we have more than 70,000 volunteers countrywide each year, which is pretty amazing. Um, I have here a slide which just highlights some of the programs we run in the Atlantic provinces. Um, and it's sort of, the, they're sort of plotted out by the bird skills required and the fitness level required. Um, so there are a couple of the programs that we're gonna talk about here today, just briefly, uh, but you'll see that the Nocturnal Owl Survey is kind of right in the middle. Um, you don't need incredible birding skills to do it, particularly here in uh, Newfoundland and Labrador, where there aren't too many, um, a species we need to worry about. And it's a fairly low fitness level required because you do this from your car. Uh, the Newfoundland Breeding Bird Atlas, on the other hand, covers pretty much all of the entire gamut here. It, uh, you can participate in the atlas if you're a new birder or if you're a very experienced birder. Uh, and depending on what you do, it can require a lot of hiking or you can do roadside surveys. Uh, so I'm just going to briefly introduce the two programs that we do run here in Newfoundland. Uh, so Birds Canada established a Newfoundland office in 2019 uh, to launch the Newfoundland Breeding Bird Atlas, which is a five-year citizen science project to map the distribution and the abundance of all of the species of birds that breed on the island of Newfoundland. And that does include owls, obviously. Um, and so what you can see here is a map in progress for the great horned owl. And essentially breeding evidence for great horned owl have, has been found in all of the colored squares that you see on the map of the island there. Uh, so I'm not gonna really talk too much more about the Atlas tonight, except to say that all of the data we collect on owls does feed into the Atlas. And if you're interested in learning more about it, you can come out to our uh, Atlasing webinar, which we are holding on April the 4th. And then of course the program that's the focus of tonight is the Atlantic Nocturnal Owl Survey. Um, so this is also a citizen science program and uh, we're gonna talk about it in quite a bit of detail today. And before I get going into the meat of tonight's presentation, I just have to take a moment to thank all of our supporters and partners. Um, and Atlas is a huge undertaking. The Nocturnal Owl Survey is a huge undertaking and uh, we really couldn't do it or put on free webinars like this without the participation of all of these partners. And tonight, I'd just like to particularly highlight the TD Friends of the Environment Foundation uh, because they have directly supported the Nocturnal Owl Survey in Newfoundland and Labrador. 
So an outline of tonight's presentation. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of an intro to owls, owl facts, and that sort of thing uh, before talking about Newfoundland and Labrador owl species. So we're going to go through those in detail and talk about some IDQs. Uh, then I'm going to talk about the nocturnal owl survey, uh, some science, some results that we've actually gotten out of that survey. And then we're going to have a little quiz at the end, because what we've learned from holding our weekly bird ID talks is that people seem to really enjoy those quizzes. So owl diversity. There are actually only two families of owls. Uh, they both belong to the order Strigiformes, and we've got the Strigidae, the true or typical owl family, and the Titanidae, the barn owl family. But in those two families, we actually have a very large number of species. So you've got 250 species worldwide. Uh, in North America, we have 19 of those species represented and only 16 in Canada. So lots and lots of different species and lots and lots of diversity. Uh, so for example, owls can vary very dramatically in size. Uh, the tiniest owl in the world is the elf owl, which is five to six inches tall and weighs about one and a half inches. And I have to say it is very much on my bucket list of birds to see. Uh, the largest North American owl in appearance is the great gray owl. Uh, and in contrast to the five to six inches of the elf owl, great gray owls are up to 32 inches tall with a wingspan of 60 inches. Um, owls also show a lot of variation in behavior. So not all of them are nocturnal, although we tend to think of them as nocturnal. Uh, and depending on the species, they, what they hunt varies dramatically. So some of them hunt reptiles and amphibians, uh, some of them hunt fish, some of them hunt birds, some of them hunt other owls, and many of them, of course, hunt small mammals. Uh, so of the 16 owls that uh, breed in Canada today, we're going to focus mainly on the six of them that breed in Newfoundland and Labrador. But before we get into that, let's talk a little bit about what unites all owls. So what are the characteristics of an owl? Uh, when people think about owls, often the first thing that comes to mind is their really big eyes. Um, so they've got these large tube-shaped eyes. Uh, owl eyes can actually be up to 3% of their body weight, uh, which is in contrast to a human where it's about 0.0003% of our body weight. Um, owl eyes also have a lot of rods. So if you think back to high school biology classes, uh, at, you can have both rods and cones in your eyes. And rods are what are responsible for vision at low light levels. Uh, so you don't have a lot of color vision using rods, but you do have good vision at low light. And owl eyes have many, many rods. Um, Owl eyes are positioned on the front of their head rather than on the side, like many other birds. And so they do have binocular vision. So they can see objects with both eyes at the same time. And that means that they have increased depth perception, uh, which is very useful for a bird of prey. However, they are farsighted. And so when they need to detect close objects, they actually have bristles around their bills, which help them detect these close objects. Something else that's really cool about owls is they cannot move their eyes. So they've got these long tube-shaped eyes, as I said, which are held in place by bony structures in the skull. They're called sclerotic rings. And what that means is they can't move their eyes from side to side the way we can. Uh, they pretty much can only look straight ahead. Their eyes move about a degree. Um, so because they can't do what we do, Instead, they have to move their entire heads to look around. Uh, and this explains why owls can turn their heads so very far around. They can actually turn their heads about 270 degrees in either direction and uh, 90 degrees up and down. So they frequently twist their head and bob and weave so that they can actually expand their field of view. Other things about owls, they have uh, facial discs. So this is the, the arrangement of feathers on the face that's sort of acts as a parabolic dish, which focuses sound towards the ears. Um, and we all know that owls have quite good hearing, uh, and they're often able to pinpoint the location of prey under snow or leaves. And this is partly because they also have asymmetrical ears. Um, so in most species, the left ear is positioned lower than the right. And because they're asymmetrical, it generates just this tiny bit of separation in when the sound reaches each ear. And that allows the owl to pinpoint the source of the sound much better than we are able to. And then finally, something else unique about owls is that they have feathers adapted for silent flight. So anyone who's ever uh, come across an owl in the wild, one of the things that, that really strikes you is how quietly they move. Um, for most birds, when you, when you see them, you also hear them flapping as they fly. Sorry, I'm getting way ahead of myself here. 
Uh, let's go back to the slide that we're actually supposed to be on. There we go. Uh, yeah, so most, most birds, they will actually, you'll hear them flying um, because as, as they move, the uh, wing flapping produces a sound. And typically the larger and faster a bird is, that, the louder that sound is. But that's not the case with owls, which are often quite large birds. Um, and this is because the structure of their feathers actually serves as a silencer. So on the front edge of their wing, they have comb-like serrations uh, that breaks up the air that's coming over the wings and cre uh, creates, or creates less of a swooshing sound. And then these smaller streams of air that are created by the combs on the front of the wing are then also absorbed by the velvety texture of the owl feathers. And then on the back of their feathers here, they have a soft fringe on the trailing edge. So instead of it being smooth, you can see that it's got a little bit of a fringe there. Um, and so all together, those structures act to absorb the sound that uh, the, the wings produce and streamline the airflow. Um, and so, there are a couple of reasons that you might think that owls need to fly silently. Uh, one is so that their prey don't hear them coming. So if you're hunting, you don't want the prey to hear you coming, and that might be why owls are such successful hunters. But another hypothesis, again, not mutually exclusive, is that owls themselves need to be able to hear their prey. And so if you're listening for prey, you don't want the sound of your own wings to get in the way. And there is evidence that both of these hypotheses are likely true. Okay, so now we'll move on to Newfoundland and Labrador's owl species. So I said there are six, there are only five represented in the slide here. Uh, one of them is uh, an owl that is actually quite, one of our six is an owl that's quite rare in the province, at least in terms of breeding. Uh, so our first and most common owl species is the great horned owl. Uh, this is kind of the stereotypical owl. So it's what people often think of when they think of an owl. Uh, they're strictly nocturnal, they roost in trees, they like to hunt along forest edges, uh, meadows, open country, and they're very impressive predators. So they're able to kill raptors and other owls. Uh, they're also able to kill porcupines, which is quite a feat. Um, so a lot of mammals uh, is, is what they go for for their diet. So there's not much around here that you're gonna mistake a great horned owl for. Um, they're a very large, stocky owl, and they're named for these ear tufts. And really, I should have put ear tufts in quotations because they're not actually ears, they're decorative feathers. Um, so you've got a very large owl with very prominent ear tufts. It does have, and you do have to look a little bit closer for this, but it does have a white throat here. And then it's got a barred uh, chest and belly. So um, I've got some sounds here and hopefully you guys will be able to hear them. Owls, because many of them are nocturnal, are much more often heard than they are seen. This is the case for a lot of birds, but particularly uh, for owls. And so we're gonna play some owl sounds here tonight. And the quiz that we're gonna do at the end is actually today going to be a sound-based quiz rather than a photo quiz. Uh, so, uh, Great horned owls sing a stereotypical owl song. So when you think about owls, you think uh, about the, the typical uh, hooting noise. And so uh, that's exactly what you get with a great horned owl. Um, it can be represented as who's awake, me too. That's kind of the rhythm of it. And I'll see if I can get it to play here. So we'll play that again. Uh, male and female great horned owls will often actually sing duets, so they'll call back and forth to each other, um, and you can tell the female's voice because it will actually be higher in pitch than the male's. So that's an example of a duet. And then the other sound that you might hear from a great horned owl is a scream, uh, which they will often give when defending the nest. So those are sounds to associate with great horned owls. Uh, the next species that we're gonna go through is a much smaller owl species, uh, Northern Sawat owls. 
are actually a relatively recent arrival on the island of Newfoundland. Uh, the first breeding record here dates from 2017. And as of right now, they're not actually found in Labrador. Uh, but they have become increasingly common on the island over the last few years. And in fact, last year, we even had a pair of breeding in the St. John's Botanical Garden. Um, so they, they use a variety of forests. They seem to prefer areas with different forest ages occurring together, uh, but obviously they're not that uncommon in uh, more urban areas as well. Uh, Sawet owls are strictly nocturnal, so during the day they roost, uh, and then you'll see them or hear them more likely active at night. Uh, and they are cavity nesters, so they nest in holes in trees that are made by woodpeckers, but they will also use nest boxes, so you will sometimes see them breeding in artificial nest boxes. So the IDQs for the northern sawwet owl, um, you've got a facial disc that's light, but no black border around it, and that's important to note. Um, you've got a large head, yellow eyes, and a dark bill, so a black bill. Uh, you've got nice heavily feathered feet, which are really cute. And then in this facial disc, you've also got a white V on the forehead there. Um, so looking for that white V between the eyes and then a striped forehead. Uh, and then you've got um, a belly with broad brown streaks and then a brown back with white braces. So these white lines along the back. The sound of the sawwet, uh, Actually, somebody was telling me tonight that he thought uh, that he had some sort of mechanical device in, in the forest in his backyard that uh, was malfunctioning, had been going off, uh, but it was in fact a solid owl. So they make an insistent series of whistled notes on roughly the same pitch, kind of like a toot 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 call, about two notes a second. Um, people have described them as a radar, or I think of a very tiny truck backing up in the forest, uh, but it is actually a very distinctive song, which I'll play for you in a second. And it's worth noting this song is actually where they get their name because people used to think think it sounded like a blade being sharpened on a whetstone. So it's not the most uh, interesting song, not the most varied song, but it is very distinctive and it's an easy one to recognize. Uh, the next owl we're going to cover is the boreal owl. So it's another nocturnal small owl. Um, and so they occupy a similar niche to solid owls. Uh, they breed in tree cavities. They consume a similar diet of small mammals, birds, and insects. Uh, these guys like boreal forests for breeding, and uh, we're less likely to see them in areas like the St. John's Botanical Garden. Um, as with most other raptors, the female boreal owl is larger than the male. And in fact, Boreal owls in particular show the largest sex difference in size of any North American owl. Uh, so the female can actually sometimes be two times heavier than the male. So IDQs for the boreal owl. Uh, again, you've got a light facial disc, but this time you've got a black frame around the edge of the facial disc with, but it's broken up by these white spots. So black, it's a broken black frame around the edge. Instead of stripes on the forehead, you've got spots. And instead of a dark bill, you've got a much lighter bill. So it's sort of a grayish color. Underneath, you've got brown and white spots and streaks. And then on the back, you've got white spots. So it's, again, it's a brown back, but you see much more extensive white on the boreal owl than you would on the solid owl. Um, and then the final thing is, this is a unique for um, owls in this province. I couldn't find a great photo where you could see the tail, but you've got these three rows of white spots on the tail. So you can kind of see the edge of two of these rows. I think this one is a wing feather, but you can see the edge of two of the rows here. Uh, so if you just see the tail of a boreal owl, that's, that's another way to distinguish them. Um, boreal owl sounds. Uh, so again, you're hearing kind of whistled toots, but they get progressively louder. Uh, and the males will sing until they find a mate or until the female starts nesting and then they pretty much stop singing. So uh, owls nest much earlier than many other species. Uh, so that's why we go out much earlier for the nocturnal owl survey than we do to find other breeding birds. So this is the boreal owl song. So 
So you can see that that uh, it's quite distinct from the solid owl sound, and you do have the, the toots getting louder as, as you progress. Okay, so we're moving on from our strictly nocturnal owls now uh, to the northern hawk owl. Uh, so these guys are unusual for a number of reasons. Uh, they do hunt during the day and they detect their prey primarily by sight and they look an awful lot like hawks, which is where they got their name. Uh, they actually have a flight pattern that's quite similar to hawks. So it's a mix of slow wing beats and long glides. Um, and uh, they're found in areas of tundra and boreal forest. Uh, near openings such as bogs, burns, or cuts, basically. So these guys in particular really like to live very far away from cities and towns. So the ID cues for a hawk owl. Uh, you've got a spotted crown and forehead. And again, you've got a black flame ar a frame around the facial disc, like the boreal owl, but this is not broken. This is a lot stronger and darker. Uh, yellow eyes and a yellow bill, strongly barred underparts, and brown back with white spots. And then you've got this long tail, which again resembles the hawk. Um, these are medium-sized owls, so they tend to be bigger than the boreal and the sawwad owls. Um, and uh, the males will sing a, a rolling whistled song, lasts about 14 seconds, and they sing this while they're performing display flights. Uh, females also sing, but they have a shorter, hoarser song. Uh, so I'm gonna play the Northern Hawk Owl song for you. So 14 seconds doesn't sound that long when you say it, but when you're listening to the song, it does actually seem like a fairly, fairly lengthy song. And I just wanted to take a minute here to specifically compare the uh, Sawet, Boreal, and Hawk Owls, uh, just to point out the differences between them. Uh, so if you consider the frame of the facial disc, on the Sawet Owl, you have a frame that sort of blends in. Uh, so you don't really have any precise line dividing the facial disc from the other head feathers. On the boreal owls, you have a dark frame, but it is broken up with those white spots. And then on the hawk owl, you have a bold black pattern. Uh, the sawwet owl has a striped forehead, but the boreal owl has a spotted forehead, and the hawk owl has a spotted forehead and a spotted crown. And then if you look at the underparts, you've got vertical stripes on the sawwet owl, uh, the boreal owl, you have a combination of vertical stripes and spots. And then on the hawk owl, you have horizontal barring. So that's quite different. And then, of course, the other easy way to tell the difference is differences in behavior. Uh, so the hawk owl is active during the day. And you've got that lovely long tail on the hawk owl, which you don't find on either the solid or the boreal owl. All right. So moving on to our last two owl species. First, we have the short-eared owl, uh, and this is an open habitat specialist. So it's actually called sometimes the grass owl because it really likes open country and wetlands. Uh, they have an unusual ability to hover while hunting, uh, and they forage both by day and night. Um, but you're not likely to come across these guys on the nocturnal owl survey because we focus on forested habitats. Uh, they cruise really quite low over open habitats looking for voles and other small mammals. And these guys nest on the ground. So ID cues for these guys, uh, they're a medium sized owl and they've got a rounded head with a light facial disc and they've got yellow eyes like many of the other species we've talked about. But uh, Jenna, I think was the one who observed that they basically have 90s grunge eye makeup. So you've got these black rims around the yellow eyes. Uh, it, yeah, it does, it does look like either they've been out for a very late night or uh, yeah, they've been partying at a 90s grunge party. Um, you do have short ear tufts, which is, and again, I say ear tufts, but they are not actually ears, They're, uh, they are display feathers. Um, the ear tufts are not really something you can count on to identify this species because they're often not visible. Uh, so you want to use other cues. They are dark streaked all over. And when you see them flying, you can actually uh, identify them by their long, broad wings and then these dark bars that they have on the wings. Uh, so if you can see the under part of the wing, these sort of wrist markings uh, are quite distinctive. Um, you, if you happen to see one close up, you can also see that there's some difference in the barring between the chest and then the belly. Uh, so on the chest, you've got 
buffy color, this sort of beige-ish with more streaking. And then as it moves down towards the belly, it gets lighter and the streaking becomes less distinct. Uh, the colors of the short-eared owls are actually a lot like dried grass, so it helps for camouflage. Uh, short-eared owls are not particularly vocal, uh, but I do have the songs for them. Uh, so their primary song is a series of a dozen or more hoots. Uh, it's also given by males during the courtship flight. Um, and so we'll play that here. <laughs> And then both males and females may bark or scream when they're defending the nest and the offspring. So I'll play that as well. Uh, so that's just a short clip, but again, quite a distinctive noise. Uh, and before we move on from the short-eared owl, I just wanted to take a moment to talk about something that's not an owl at all, another bird of prey. Uh, but the reason that I wanted to distinguish between the short-eared owl and the northern harrier is that northern harriers are found in similar habitat and they hunt in a similar fashion. So if you're going to confuse a short-eared owl with anything, it's probably going to be a northern harrier. Uh, what you want to look for uh, on the harrier is that you're going to see a longer tail. And you're also going to see this white rump, both on the male and the female harrier. So that's really distinctive on harriers, whereas on a short-eared owl, you don't see that, uh, that white rump. If you can see the underwing, you can see these two dark bars on the underwing of the short-eared owl, whereas you just have dark primary tips on the harrier, on the male harrier. Uh, so you should be able to, dis to distinguish between them, but it is that, that is the species it is most likely to be confused with. Okay, and our last owl, the snowy owl. And that's the one that was not represented in the photos that I had on our initial Newfoundland and Labrador owl slide. Uh, so this is the largest North American owl by weight. And it does show up irregularly in Newfoundland during the winter to hunt uh, in sort of the windswept fields of some of the coastal plains. Uh, and this happens particularly when lemmings are scarce uh, further north which is where they usually winter. And uh, we have had a winter where a lot of people have seen snowy owls, but when it comes to the breeding season, um, the only place in the province that you would be likely to see a snowy owl is kind of up in the Torngat Mountains. So the far Northern reaches of Labrador. Uh, snowy owls spend their summers north of the Arctic Circle hunting lemmings, ptarmigan, and other prey like that. Uh, and they do hunt by day, which is good because north of the Arctic Circle, uh, some of them are in 24 hour daylight, so they have no choice but to hunt by day. Um, they are fierce protectors of their nest and they will actually attack predators as large as humans and wolves when they approach the nest. Um, I didn't put field marks on this owl because it's really hard to confuse a snowy owl with anything. There's not much to say except all white bird with yellow eyes. Uh, males can be all white or they can have some brown on them. Um, Females and immature snowy owls, however, uh, will have extensive um, brown barring on them. However, the face will always be pure white. So the face of a snowy owl is always gonna be pure white. Um, it's quite hard to find snowy owl recordings. Not many people have made recordings of them. They, they really do breed quite far north, uh, but both sexes, particularly the males, will make low, powerful, rasping hoots um, which are often given two at a time, but not always. Uh, and they can actually be heard for up to seven miles on the tundra. So I will play the recording I have of the snowy owl. Ooh. Ooh. So this guy you'll notice is not giving his hoots two at a time, he's giving them singly. Okay, so we've covered the six species of owls that I mentioned uh, we have breeding here in this province. Uh, and I'd like to move on to talk a little bit about our relationship with owls. Um, people are fascinated with, by owls. So they're important in the mythology of a number of cultures. Uh, in ancient Greece, owls were the symbol of the goddess of wisdom, Athena. And uh, the owl was a protector and uh, they would accompany Greek armies to war. So um, in images and uh, provide inspiration for their daily lives as ornaments. And if an owl flew over Greek soldiers before a battle, they took it as a sign of victory. Uh, conversely, in ancient Rome, owls were associated with death and misfortune. 
Uh, so if you heard the hoot of an owl, it meant you were on your way out. And apparently owls predicted the death of Julius Caesar, Augustus, and Agrippa. Um, and if owls flew over the Roman troops on the, on the field of battle, they were assumed to predict failure. Um, I also probably should take a moment to explain this photo. I felt that I had to use it uh, because we're talking about owls and people and our relationship to owls. Uh, that is in fact a burrowing owl in the bathroom. Uh, I have a good friend who is responsible for the reintroduction of the burrowing owl population in the Okanagan Valley in British Columbia. And as part of their program, they have education owls, which they take to classes to introduce to children and to, to demonstrate. And so uh, occasionally when she had two classes on the same day, she would temporarily put her uh, education owl, whose name is Pilot, in the bathroom. And it was always a little bit of a surprise when you went into the bathroom to take a shower and found an owl sitting on the curtain rail. It was probably my favorite owl picture ever, particularly because he is actually sitting on an owl shower curtain, which just makes it all the better. Of course, the other thing that we need to talk about when we talk about owls and people, uh, that would be threats to owls. Uh, so today we generally are fascinated by owls. We don't think of them as bad luck anymore, uh, but many owl populations are experiencing decline for a number of human-based reasons. Uh, so one major cause of population decline is uh, habitat loss or fragmentation um, of the, the areas which these owls depend on. Uh, so for example, the Northern spotted owl populations in BC rely on old growth forest and they have been devastated by the logging of the old growth forest there. Uh, so the species has declined extremely dramatically and is now listed as endangered. Uh, like many, many bird species worldwide, climate change can also be a major threat to owls. Um, they can also be hit by vehicles. And uh, weirdly tonight, I was actually talking to somebody who had just hit a solid owl in St. John's with his car. Uh, however, when he got out and went to check on the owl, he picked it up and uh, the owl was apparently just stunned because it took off very quickly. Okay, so it's important to track owl populations because a lot of the things we do are threatening to them. But as top predators, owls can also be excellent indicators of environmental health. So knowing what's going on with owl populations can also be really important to tell us about the health of the ecosystem. The problem is that it's actually not that easy to monitor owl populations. So owls uh, tend to be quite elusive. Uh, many of them are nocturnal, and so we don't encounter them on a regular basis. And so we really need sort of specialized programs to try and track owl populations. And of course, this brings us to the Atlantic Nocturnal Owl Survey. Um, so this is just one chapter of a countrywide uh, nocturnal owl survey, which is run every year in every Canadian province. Um, and so this is a big citizen science survey here in the Atlantic provinces. We run it from the 1st of April to the 15th of May each year. And it's a roadside survey. So uh, essentially it involves citizen scientists going out to predetermined routes of 10 stops uh, for just one day between the 1st of April and the 15th of May and listening for owls and recording what they hear. And it's a particularly excellent program for beginning birders, especially here in Newfoundland and Labrador, because we don't have that many species to learn. So it's relatively easy to feel that you have the knowledge that you need to take part in this survey. So the Atlantic Nocturnal Owl Survey has been happening for a very long time. So we have more than 20 years of data from the Atlantic Nocturnal Owl Survey uh, from the maritime provinces. And of course, they have species there that we don't get here, um, including the barred owl, which is the top photo there, uh, the eastern screech owl, which is the middle photo. Uh, that's a pretty rare visitor in the maritimes, but they do get them occasionally, and the long-eared owl on the bottom. Uh, so the map you see there is the map that's available on our database interface, and all of those little points are owl routes of 10 stops each. Uh, the red ones are the ones that are adopted by volunteers, and the green ones are the ones that are available. Uh, I think that picture was taken last year, so things shift pretty frequently with this, but you can see that there are routes all over all three maritime provinces, um, and the, the uptake is pretty good. There aren't too many that are available. Here in Newfoundland, our situation is a little bit different. Uh, so the Newfoundland and Labrador Nocturnal Owl Survey was launched in 2018. 
Um, and at the time, 33 routes were established in Newfoundland and two routes were established in Labrador. And I apologize to anybody from Labrador who's here tonight. I have cut it off in this picture. It's difficult to get the whole province and make the routes big enough to see. Uh, but there are, at the moment, four routes in Labrador. Uh, so started in 2018, data was collected in 2018 and 2019. Uh, the first official year that we ran it was the 2020 season, where unfortunately the survey was canceled due to COVID. So last year was actually Birds Canada's first year really running the survey here in Newfoundland and Labrador. And it turned out to be an amazing success. So we managed to get people to cover almost all of the existing routes. And we actually added 22 new routes to the, to the map. So we added uh, 20 routes in Newfoundland and two in Labrador. And we're on track to grow again this year. So we have at least, new eight, at least eight new routes under consideration this year, which is fantastically exciting. But as you can see, we still have a long way to go. Um, you may notice there are a few uh, quite obvious gaps in this map, in particular, South Central Newfoundland and all of the Northern Peninsula. Uh, so we're really hoping to add some routes in some of these areas and see if we can improve our coverage and get a, a better picture of owl populations all across the province. Uh, obviously, the four routes in Labrador also don't go a long way to covering all of Labrador. Uh, so we're really looking for people who might be interested in surveying for owls in Labrador. How do you participate in the Nocturnal Owl Survey? Uh, so first you have to register on Nature Counts, which is our database interface. Uh, so the address is on the bottom there for anybody who might be interested in checking out the Nocturnal Owl Survey. Uh, once, you're, once you're registered on there, you'll be able to access that map that I showed you for the Maritime Provinces. We have a similar map for Newfoundland and Labrador, which shows you where all of the routes are and which ones are available. So you look for a free route and you adopt it. Um, as I said, we are still working to expand the survey in this province. And so here, if there's no route near you uh, and you're interested in setting one up, you can email me and uh, I will work with you to try and set up a new route. Uh, if you live somewhere like the Avalon Peninsula, where most of our routes are actually adopted already, you can still send me an email to express your interest. Um, often people aren't able to complete the survey kind of uh, due to unforeseen reasons, and it may be a bit of a last minute thing. So last year we did have a couple people uh, who uh, at the last minute weren't able to complete their routes and we had to find replacements for them. Uh, so it's great to have some backup on hand. Uh, then you want to train and be prepared. Uh, so we have a training uh, soundtrack that is available on our website. So you can practice your owl songs. There are also lots and lots of online resources. Um, you can check out Dendroika, which is a free online database, uh, which allows you to quiz yourself on bird species. You can pick a particular region um, and you can quiz yourself on photos or on sounds. Uh, you can also check out the Merlin app for your phone. Uh, and you can do quizzes on eBird as well with uh, sounds. So you can train yourself in any number of ways uh, and just be prepared. So we have the protocol booklet that we hand out and uh, you can read what you need to do to participate in, um, in the OWL survey. Then once our season starts, which is in just over a week, you choose one evening to survey your route. Uh, so point, the problem there is that you do actually have to choose a good weather evening. Uh, which can be a challenge, as anybody who lives here in Newfoundland and Labrador will know. Uh, so by good weather, I mean it can't be too cold. It's got to be above minus 15 degrees Celsius. Uh, that's not usually a problem in most of Newfoundland at this time of year, but possibly on the Northern Peninsula and certainly in Labrador, it could be a challenge. Um, it can't be persistently snowing or raining. And very importantly, it can't be too windy. Uh, so the cutoff is Beaufort level three. Oh, I think we've got somebody not muted. Uh, if you could mute yourself, that would be great. Uh, okay, so our wind cutoff is Beaufort level three. So that translates to winds below 20 kilometers an hour. Um, and anybody who's done the survey below probably realize, or survey before probably realizes that that is the major challenge, finding a day that is not too windy. And then once you've done the survey, we actually have an online um, database where you can enter the data yourself, or you can send it to me and I will do it. So when you sign up for a route, uh, you get a map that looks a little bit like this. So it shows you where all of the stops are located. Uh, as I said, you've got 10 stops at least two kilometers apart. And uh, 
basically there are they should all be along roads and uh, you, you should be able to pull off relatively safely at all of those uh, spots. So safety is one of our primary concerns. Uh, we do recommend that people go out with a partner and we do also recommend that if people have high visibility vests, they wear those. Um, because certainly we don't want anybody getting hurt doing a survey. We also recommend that you check out your route in the daylight first, uh, because that it's an awful lot easier to see where you're going at that point. At each stop, you'll pull the car over, uh, get out and use a portable speaker to broadcast a, a special broadcast track. Uh, so this track alternates silent listening periods, which I've shown here in blue, with playback of boreal owl song and solid owl song. And so we use this playback to increase our ability to detect owls. Uh, but this is also a reason that we ask you to do the survey on one night only. So we don't want people going out and doing it multiple nights throughout the season uh, because playback is a source of disturbance to owls. Uh, so they think there's another owl in the area and that can be either viewed as competition or sometimes as a potential predator. Uh, and so we keep our use of playback to a minimum. We only do it one night to increase our chances of detecting owls. Uh, and it, that it does keep the disturbance relatively uh, to a minimum, but we do need to get a permit to do this, which is also available on our website. Uh, and we do ask that you only do it the once. So just to go through, data entry can be a little bit confusing for this. So I'm just gonna give an example of a survey. Um, so we're interested not just in how many owls you hear and of what species, but exactly when you hear them, uh, because that gives us the ability to do more like the data. So for example, uh, to do more with the data, sorry, to, exam to examine how species respond to playback, for example. So let's say you're doing an owl survey and you're at your first stop and during the first silent minute, you hear nothing. But during the second silent minute, you hear a great horned owl hooting. So that's the who's awake, me too. Uh, in your little data table, you would put an X for the great horned owl at minute two. Then after the first boreal owl playback, which is about 20 seconds, you then hear the great horned owl continuing to sing, but this time it actually approaches and you get a look at it. At the same time, you also get a response from a solid owl. In that case, you would use the same line because you've got the same great horned owl, but you're gonna add an S for seen. So you both heard it and saw it during that period. If you just saw it, you would just put an S there. You're also gonna add a new line for a Northern solid owl, which you just heard after that, after the first boreal owl playback. After the second boreal owl playback, you don't hear the great horned owl anymore, but now you hear two solid owls. Uh, so you hear the same guys you did before plus a second. Uh, in that case, you're going to add a second line. So you won't put two X's here. You're going to add a second line for your second individual. That's the important thing when doing the survey. Each individual is their own separate line. Uh, then let's say after the first saw what owl playback, you have silence, which means you wouldn't change your data sheet at all. But then after the second saw what playback, you have now two great horned owls duetting back and forth. And you think based on the location that one is the same individual that you had before, but one is a different individual. Uh, so in that case, what you would do is you would use the same line. Uh, this guy, this great horned owl has now uh, sung after the, during the second silent minute, after the first boreal owl call, and after the second solid owl call, uh, and the second great horned owl only sang after the second Northern solid owl call. Uh, so we do have detailed instructions in our protocol manual, uh, which is available on the website and which we send to participants. But I wanted to kind of walk people through it as well, because uh, it's really important to get the data entry correct so that we get as much information as possible from the survey. Okay, for the last few minutes, I'm actually gonna talk a little bit about why we do the survey and what we've learned from it. So why is it that we go to all of this trouble? Um, as I said, it's a Canada-wide survey, and that's really neat because even though we use different playbacks because we have different species in different regions, uh, we have that two-minute period of silence in all of the OWL surveys, and that allows us to compare what's going on across Canada. So first and most importantly, 
uh, the OWL survey enables us to keep track of populations over time. So what's going on with populations? Uh, it is a long-term survey. We really like it when people sign up for ROOT and keep doing it year after year. And there are some people in the maritime provinces who have been doing their survey routes for the entire 22 years that the survey has been active, which is pretty amazing. Um, so I'm going to show you some data for OWL population trends that were derived from the nocturnal OWL survey data. Uh, collected by volunteers in the three maritime provinces. Um, obviously, this isn't something we can do with our data here in Newfoundland and Labrador yet because we don't have enough years. But in 20 years, I will get back to you and we'll see what our population trends look like here. Um, so you can see that these are graphs of the global trends over 20 years, so from 2001 to 2020 for each province, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, and PEI. And uh, this is for barred owls. So you can see that for barred owls, you see an overall pop, uh, positive trend in all three provinces over the 20 years. Uh, but when you compare that to great horned owls, you see the opposite trend. So you see a decrease in great horned owls. And the message with solid owls is a little bit less clear. Um, in, in PEI, it looks like a decline. Elsewhere, it looks like it's relatively stable. And you see a lot of scatter. Um, it, it's almost a cyclic situation. And that's really interesting because uh, it ties in with some work that has been done at, a, at the University uh, St. Anne um, on the southern shore of Nova Scotia, uh, where they have been looking at sawwet owls um, during fall migration. So they've been working at this study site down here, uh, and they have been catching and banding sawwet owls on fall migration. So over uh, the past or during the eight years between 2012 and 2020, they banded 220 sawwets. And northern sawwets are what we call eruptive migrants, which means that they exploit food sources that vary a lot in distribution from year to year. So things like mice and voles. And because the concentration of food varies a lot from year to year, the owls themselves are very flexible in their movements. And so there's a lot of variability in how many individuals this group was catching from year to year. Uh, so some years they get a lot of owls, some years they get very few owls. And what they found is that variation is on a two-year cycle. So every two years they would catch an extremely high number of migrants. And in the years where they catch those many, many migrants, they found that immature owls were at least twice as common as adults. So what you see on this graph here is the ratio of immature owls, the hatchier birds, to adults. And you can see that every couple of years, you get a relatively high ratio, particularly in 2020, where it was actually uh, 21 to one, I think. They caught 42 immature owls and just two adults. And so this really high ratio of hatchier to adult birds suggests that one of the reasons we might see these eruptions, these high concentrations of uh, solid owls is because High prey availability leads to an increased breeding density of adults and more offspring produced. Um, but if that's the case, you should be able to see this same cyclic pattern in the nocturnal owl survey data. And it turns out you actually can. Uh, so the, the team actually looked at owl, um, da owl data collected as part of the nocturnal owl survey. And they found that in years where you have lots and lots of um, hatchier birds and high numbers of owls going through on migration, those are the years where you actually had a lot of solid owls as well on the nocturnal owl survey. Uh, so it's a really cool use of data collected for the nocturnal owl survey and it's going to be published this year in a scientific journal. There's also lots and lots of applications for land management of the nocturnal owl survey data. Um, so this is a this is a study that they were uh, that has been done with barred owls, uh, specifically in New Brunswick. Uh, so when the owl survey routes in New Brunswick were laid out, they were laid out to try and compare what was going on on private land and on public land. So how the land was managed. Um, so barred owls uh, have specialized habitat requirement. Um, they depend on cavities in large trees for nesting. So they really need older forest because they need these big, big trees with cavities. Um, and the presence or abundance of barred owls therefore reflects the health of more mature older forests. So they can be a really good um, indicator of sustainable forest management. 
And so using nocturnal owl survey data, Birds Canada actually compared the population trend from 2001 to 2020 on private land and on public land. And what they found is that uh, the population of barred owls has been relatively stable on public land, but it's actually done better on, in privately managed land. So it's, you're seeing that there's an increase on private lands. And this suggests that prior forest management decisions might have influenced their populations. So for example, uh, some private owners who've left big blocks of forest uh, mature enough to contribute to the population of barred owls, uh, they may actually be seeing an increase in the population on their land. Uh, but on crown land, you've got specific forest management practices that limit the amount and the availability of those older stands. Uh, and so they may not be as suitable for the species. Uh, so in the future, Birds Canada is hoping to look a little bit more into this and figure out why we're seeing uh, the, these differences, because right now we're just speculating. So it will be interesting to see what it is about privately managed land that's really good for barred owls. And uh, it's, worth noticing, or it's worth noting that we often call the barred owl an umbrella species uh, because when we protect their habitat, which is these, these old growth forests with large trees with cavities, that also protects other species uh, that depend on the old growth forest. Okay, so another use for the data from the nocturnal owl survey is to establish owl habitat associations. Uh, so this is an example in PEI. Um, it's a work in progress. It was, uh, this, this analysis was done by Katie Stedholm, who worked for Birds Canada last year. Um, and she's looking at the relationship between the habitat of the owl roots, which you can see the black dots there, uh, and owl abundance. So PEI was once mostly forested, but now nearly half of it, so about 43% of it, is cleared for agricultural use. And much of the forest is young, uh, so you don't have those, for example, mature old trees that barred owls like. Um, so we've looked at the different types of habitats where different species are detected. And what Katie found is that when you're looking at barred owls, uh, they like mixed hardwood and conifer mature forest and larger, less isolated forest patches. So they, they don't like fragmented uh, forests. Whereas the great horned owl, they like mature uh, softwoods, so spruce and fir forest and open wetland areas. And then Northern sawwood owls, they seem to be more tolerant of those younger forests, uh, but they still prefer larger, less isolated forest patches. Okay, uh, so other applications for the owl survey, um, putting rare species on the map. Uh, so this is an example from the second maritime breeding bird atlas. Uh, you can see the three maritime provinces there, and you can see the uh, breeding locations for boreal owls, which are quite rare in the maritimes. Uh, so it's really hard to analyze data for rare species as a scientist, but it's really important to know where they are because that should inform our decisions about land management and protection. Um, and so this is particularly important for the, for the Newfoundland uh, and Labrador nocturnal owl survey because we are in the middle of our first ever breeding bird atlas here in Newfoundland. And so we're really looking to use the owl survey to feed into the atlas and tell us where our owls are. Uh, the Newfoundland, or sorry, the nocturnal owl survey is also really important for environmental assessments. Again, uh, when you're making land management decisions, you really need to know what's out there. And then the final uh, point in favor of the nocturnal owl survey is the community engagement that it brings. So as I said, it's a, it's a relatively easy survey to get into if you're just starting out as a birder. Uh, and it's a great experience. So uh, anyone who's ever done it, I, pretty much everyone I've talked to has really enjoyed it. Uh, it's great. It's fun to be out at night in nature where we often aren't. An owl encounter is a major bonus. Uh, you can finish the night with some hot chocolate. It's just a fantastic uh, survey and a fantastic way to really get people out in nature and collecting data and contributing it to actual science. And I just wanted to finish by talking about what we can maybe get out of the Newfoundland and Labrador nocturnal owl survey, uh, because I'm really hoping that we won't have to wait 20 years to find out what's going on here. Uh, so one of the things that I'm hoping we can do with this data is investigate this question of the Sawat range expansion that I've sort of alluded to a number of times. Uh, so as I said, Northern Sawat owls are relatively recent arrivals in the province. Uh, so first breeding was detected in Newfoundland in 2017. 
Uh, but since then, the population has kind of exploded and they do seem to be quite common these days. Uh, and this is in contrast to the pattern that birders are reporting for our other small owl, the boreal owl, uh, which seems to be a little bit less common. And so there is this perception among birders that it's possible that uh, because they occupy similar niches, that the sawwood owls are sort of driving the boreal owls out. And I think that this is, this is information we can get at using the nocturnal owl survey data because we can figure out where the sawwits are, where the bore, boreal owls are, and whether there's overlap and potentially whether there's interaction between the species by looking at who responds to which playback. Okay, so I hope I've convinced you that the nocturnal owl survey is a worthwhile use of your time. And I'm just gonna finish up with a test of your knowledge. Uh, so hopefully you will be able to hear these, uh, these playbacks and you'll be able to offer your opinion about what species we have here. Catherine, so, can I just jump in for one second? Cause there was a question in the chat. So if anybody <laughs> had to leave earlier, um, someone wanted to know if it's better to do the surveys in May or in April, or if it matters about the timing. That's a really good question. Um, it partly depends on your route, to be honest. Some routes are gonna be inaccessible until the snow has melted. Uh, so, and some routes are gonna be inaccessible after the snow has melted. Uh, so a lot of the time it does depend on your route. We chose the time of the survey because it's the time when owls should be most active. Um, that being said, I myself went out right at the beginning of the survey window last year in uh, Gross, uh, not Grossmoren, sorry, Terranova Park and found no owls whatsoever, whereas somebody who went out more towards the end of the survey window had much more luck on a route that was very nearby. Um, so I would say maybe pushing it back a little bit, maybe not going out next Friday uh, on April, April the 1st to, to try on the very first possible day. It might be better to wait a little bit, but try not to wait too long because we do have uh, very few good weather days here. And so it's important to make use of them when they come and not uh, not keep waiting because you can find yourself on May 13th and there's no good weather predicted. Was there anything else, Jenna, that we needed to address before we move on with the quiz? Um, thanks, no, that was the only one um, that I wanted to get in before you finished up. Fantastic, thank you. Thanks. All right, so I will play this sound. Uh, and then I will launch a poll and you will be able to pick which species you think it is. Okay, so which species was that? Okay, last, last answers. I'm gonna close the poll in a minute. We've got 80% participation, which is fantastic. All right, we'll end the poll now and I'll share the results. So more than 50% of you got it right. That was a boreal owl. Uh, hang on a second and I will uh, pull up the picture there. So that was a boreal owl. Um, some of you do have northern sawwet, and I can absolutely understand the confusion, but with sawwets, you're listening for that sort of consistent volume, consistent pitch, very measured, uh, as opposed to sort of speeding up and getting louder the way you do with uh, the way you hear with the boreal owl. Okay, so we have four more. Um, and that's our boreal owl playing again. Let's see if we can get, there we go. Here's our next mystery sound. Oh, okay, I can't play it or I can't play the sound and uh, do the poll simultaneously. So hang on a second, I'll play the sound again. And then I'll relaunch the poll.
All right, we've got 90% participation. So any last minute guesses? All right, I'll end the poll and share the results. Uh, this was a little bit of a harder one, um, but we still have more than 50% of people getting it right. That is a Northern Hawk Owl. Uh, so that's that sort of rolling, undulating kind of call. Um, again, with the saw wet, you're expecting that consistent uh, volume, frequency, sort of a measured, uh, think of it like a radar or a truck backing up. Okay. All right. So now we have our next sound here. All right, so who was that? Okay, any last minute guesses? We've got more than 80% have participated again, so it's great to see so much participation in the polls. Okay, all right, I'm gonna end it and I'll share the results. And I have to admit this, this was a trick question, guys. So 19% of people got it right. The answer was none of the above because that was not an owl at all. Um, interestingly though, nobody or almost nobody guessed boreal owl, which is the thing that it sounds most like. Uh, so this was a Wilson snipe, um, a shorebird, not an owl. And instead of making the sound as a vocalization, they make it during their display flight. Uh, so it's the wind passing over their modified tail feathers that makes that sound. Uh, but it does sound an awful lot like a boreal owl. And so this is the one really tricky thing about the nocturnal owl survey being able to distinguish between a boreal owl and a Wilson snipe. Uh, and the trick to doing so, and it's tricky for everyone, even super experienced birders, uh, but the trick to doing so is often to listen to where the sound is coming from. So boreal owls will sit in the bushes or in the trees and they will vocalize from one spot. Whereas because this is a sound that the snipe makes during its flight, it's going to be moving and it's going to be coming largely from the sky overhead. Um, so it is very, very tricky. And we are actually going to be posting on our website um, a, a self-assessment quiz where you can listen to some different recordings of snipe and of boreal owls to, to sort of help you practice telling the difference between them. Okay, so we just have two more. Uh, and so this is our next <laughs> test sound. I'll play that once more. Okay, so who is that? Well, people are very sure of this one. The answers are coming in very, very quickly. And we're at almost 90% of people have answered. Does anyone wanna make a last minute guess? Okay, so yep, 95% of you guessed the same thing and you are indeed correct. Uh, this is a great horned owl. So that's that classic hooting, who's awake, me too um, pattern that you'll hear with great horned owls. So nice job guys. And one final sound to test.
Okay, so who is making our last mystery sound? And again, people seem pretty sure of this one. Any last minute guesses before I close the poll? Okay. So once again, uh, people overwhelmingly voted for one option, the Northern Sawwet Owl, and that is indeed what it was. So that's that sort of monotonous, single note, relatively measured tooting noise that sounds a little bit like a truck backing up. So well done, everybody. I'm really impressed, uh, particularly the last two people really have learned their sounds. So that's excellent. Um, and I'll just finish up by... Uh, quickly mentioning that it's really important when you're doing this survey or even when you're not doing the survey to respect owls and to to sort of pay attention to the difference between a stressed owl uh, so one that's wide-eyed preparing to fly and a defense display and a relaxed owl uh, so stretching hunting preening often sleeping during the daytime uh, and when you are out doing owl survey or when you're just out in nature, you wanna to remember to give owls space, uh, to move slowly, keep your voice low, not to feed them, uh, avoid using playback. So obviously with the exception of the survey, which we do have a permit for, uh, it's not something you wanna do regularly and also to avoid flash photography. So it's really tempting on the rare occasion that you see an owl to take their photo, uh, but you really wanna try and avoid doing that uh, because it does stress them out when you, uh, when you use flash photography at night. Okay, and I'll just finish up there. I've given the Atlas website, um, the Nocturnal Owl Survey website and my email. So if anybody is interested in uh, creating their own Nocturnal Owl Survey route, please let me know because it's certainly something that I'm hoping to do, continue to expand the survey. And thank you all for coming tonight. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, there's lots of thanks coming into the chat. Um, and I wanted to ask actually, if you wanted to mention maybe Zoom recorders for folks who think that they're not quite sure about identifying by sound yet. That is a very good point. Uh, so we have recorders that we use for the Atlas, but we will also be using for the Nocturnal Owl Survey. So they're little handheld recorders. Uh, you can take them out with you and you can record the entire playback sequence. Uh, and then that can help you to go back afterwards and identify what you heard. Uh, and if you're not sure, you can also bring the recording to us and we can work with you to figure out what it was. Uh, so we will have those available to borrow. We will also have some limited number of um, portable speakers to borrow for people who don't have anything that they can use to broadcast the playback track. Perfect. There's also somebody in the chat wondering about vehicle lights during the survey. Ideally, they would be off. Um, however, safety first, always. Uh, so if you are worried that you are in a place where you are going to, uh, where you need to tell people that you're there, uh, first of all, let me know because probably we want to change that route. That's not a great stop. Uh, but also, it, you know, keep yourself safe first. Something that um, we had success with last Last winter when we did our owl survey was also wearing high vis vest um, or something high vis just so that if your lights are off and cars come up, someone can still see you when you're on the road. Yep. Or near the road, I guess. <laughs> I guess we need a high vis vest for the cars too. Yes. <laughs> okay, I don't see any other questions in chat right now. Um, but again, lots of thanks coming in. People love the quiz and I think you're maybe going to get some emails. Um, I don't know if you were planning on sending out a follow-up email with some links in it or not. Um, yeah, absolutely. I'll send up a follow, send out a follow-up email uh, next week. Perfect. Okay. Well, if there are no questions, I'm getting off easy tonight. Uh, then <laughs> I will. Uh, I will just say thank you again for coming, and uh, we really. We've really appreciated you coming out and uh, talking about owls with us. Have a lovely evening. <laughs>